we've 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 developed so many workarounds uh, to get around live live and recording and going live over the internet. And uh, uh, so anyway, I'm going to move along. Uh, Eric Clavel, am I saying that right? Clavel, Clavel, uh, has worked for two and a half decades in politics, public policy, education, and law. As a political and legal analyst, he has appeared in various news outlets to provide insight on current issues. As a professor, he has taught constitutional law and civil rights uh, and courses in politics and public policy. His areas of interest are in law and public policy uh, during the time of uh, the time period of slavery, reconstruction, segregation, and Jim Crow, and increasing the numbers of underrepresented groups in the fields of law and public policy. He is also the creator and co-host of the award-winning radio commentary, uh, <laughs> the Clav, Cl I'm so sorry, Clavil, Clavil, <laughs> Clavil Report on WHO. <laughs> I do my best, but I have my limitations. Uh, it, 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 it is not a difficult name, and I'm just but butchering it. Uh, another view uh, with Barbara Hamley and the creator and host of State of the Water uh, on Norfolk State University's own uh, WNSB 91.1 FM. Uh, on both shows, he informs the public on issues of law, policy, politics, and education. He's a uh, 2000 graduate of the Southern University Nelson Mandela School of Public Policy with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Political Science and a 2006 cum laude graduate, honors graduate of Southern University Law Center, where he received his Juris Doctorate. He is also a 2009 graduate of Louisiana State University with a Master's of Library and Information Science a licensed attorney and certified mediator. So, Dr. Clavel, please. Everyone, too? All right, there we go. All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And look, this is the fun part that I get to do all day. Uh, we deal a lot with a lot of policy and politics and so forth. But being in class, you know, talking about history and policy and really giving information and to change the world is really where what I love to do. So sit back, enjoy this. This is not, not just a lecture, but it's an engagement. We're going to have a conversation tonight. Um, again, I'd like to greet everyone and thank you for being here in attendance. I know we haven't seen each other in a while, uh, so it's good that we are able to come together. And for those that are viewing us across um, online and those that will also see this as it will be uh, archived as well. First, I'd like to thank the Hampton History Museum for inviting me to this very special event uh, for the commemoration of the contraband this month. Also, a special thanks to Mr. Will Pell and Alan Holman uh, for helping me to ensure that I had everything that I need to make sure that this presentation goes seamlessly. It's my belief that the contraband decision itself, though little known, is one of the most powerful decisions ever agreed upon and enacted, especially for the rights of African Americans and oppressed groups in our great country. There have been many, many, many other pieces of legislation, acts, statutes, um, and the like that have really helped to remedy the wrongs of the past. But the contraband decision was the one that started it all. Now, according to, of course, the history, uh, the Hampton History Museum, we know that on May 23rd, 1861, there were three enslaved men, Shepard Mallory, Frank Baker, James Townsend, that escaped to Fort Monroe, setting in motion a mass wave of self emancipation, and that's, that's key, self-emancipation, because that goes against the narrative that was pushed after the Civil War by the daughters of the Confederacy in showing that blacks themselves that were enslaved were lazy, shiftless, uh, step and fetches, and things of that nature. But self-emancipation is very powerful because it shows that you have the fortitude, you have the drive, you have the belief that I can do and make better for myself and don't have to wait for anyone else. The power, being of, the power of miseducation and the power of education meets head to head just with that particular word itself. But we all know that 
that self-emancipation eventually would lead to the abolition of slavery here in the United States. Now, of course, these individuals knowing that secession vote actually changed Virginia's legal and political landscape along with other states, and we'll talk about what those other states are or were in, in, at the end of this particular uh, lecture and where they stand today and where we are in 2022. But these individuals, they gamble on their lives that they could stay at Fort Monroe. Now we'll find in history, there were many that actually perished there at the fort because of disease, poor living conditions and the like. But they gambled on themselves. And that's, in my opinion, the true story of America, gambling on yourself to believe that you can make better for yourself. And they did. And fortunate enough for them, they were not returned to slavery, but they were allowed to remain as contraband of war. And by the mid we had over 1,000 other freedom seekers that were gathered near the fort, known at that time as Freedom Fortress. So you ask the question, why is that so important? You know, why ask, why risk your lives for something that's only a hope or a dream. But in order to understand that, and in order to understand their action, we first have to understand history and where our country was at that particular time. I teach from a prism of history, economics, public policy and law, politics, and social interaction between people and cultures. When you understand those five areas of our existence, you understand why things exist. You also understand, understand why things don't exist. And from time to time, you can also kind of predict the future. To my friend that listens to me on Barbara Hans Lee's show, he knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> but let's take a look at what life was like before the countryman decision. It was a tale of two Americas. The life before the Civil War was really a tale of those that had rights, opportunities, access to society systems, and those that simply did not. It was a tale of freemen and women and the enslaved. It was also a tale of those that would have a head start of almost a quarter of a millennium, 250 years, to build a legacy. Again, I said an opportunity to do so. And 250 years of those that simply did not have the opportunity, but rather was forced to dig a hole of debt for themselves. This was the institution of slavery in our country. According to the Constitutional Rights Foundation, the lives of black people under slavery in the South were controlled by a web of customs, rules, and laws known as slave codes. Now this is key because these slave codes ended up becoming black codes after the Civil War. And we'll talk more about that later. But these slave codes could not travel. Slaves couldn't travel without a written pass. They were forbidden to learn how to read and write. They could be searched at any time. They could not buy or sell things without a permit. They couldn't own livestock. They couldn't own property. They couldn't really have money. And they were subject to curfew single night. Not only that, but they were subject to any person, any white man or woman, in order to their rules. Let's give an example of marriage. Marriage is an institution that was, we know, given to us uh, from God from the very beginning. But marriage among slaves had no legal standing and always required the approval of that time of the master. Generally, slaves could marry others that were living at that plantation or at neighboring ones. Now, Solomon Northup discovered the following rules during his enslavement in Louisiana. He said that either party could have as many husbands or wives as the owner will permit, and either it is at liberty to discard the other at their pleasure. But the law in relation to bigamy and so forth was not applicable to property or slaves. If the wife does not belong to the same plantation with the husband, the latter would be permitted to visit her on Saturday nights if the distance wasn't too far. Can you imagine that? But 
that was our country. That's what existed for one quarter of our existence. And actually, more than that, because we're not even 500 years into existence. But that was our life. That was our style. That was how we operated day and night, day and night. So let's go back to Mallory. Let's go back to Baker. Let's go back to Townsend. The hope and the dream of self-emancipation and what that could actually do. That's powerful within itself when actually knowing, knowing the life that they live. So we find ourselves after, of course we're you know, moving full, full speed ahead here, so I just passed about 225 years. So, so we're a country at a crossroads. We have the pro-slavery and the abolitionists. Now according to the US, textbook, US History Online textbook, the Southern argument for slavery, quote, it was those who defended slavery rose to the challenge set forth by the abolitionists. The defenders of slavery included e uh, economics, history, religion, legality, social good, even humanitarianism to further their arguments. You ask yourself, why economics? Hmm? Why social good? Let's take a look. Defenders of slavery argued that the substance to the slave economy. Now, I argue that slavery itself was a business decision because it was the epitome of capitalism. The base of capitalism is to have as many workers as you can to create the product and pay as least as you can in order to make the greatest profit at the very top. Adam Smith, the invisible hand. So when you look at American slavery, it was the perfect pyramid of capitalism. It was too much money to be made to end it. So those that were defenders of it said to end the slave economy would have, have a profound and killing economic impact, especially in the South, where there was major reliance upon slave labor and the foundation of their economy, of course, was agriculture. The cotton economy would collapse, collapse. the tobacco crop would drop in the fields, rice would cease being profitable. They also defended if slaves were free, there would be widespread unemployment and chaos. This would lead to uprising, bloodshed, anarchy. They pointed to mobs, rule of terror during the French Revolution, and argued for the continuation of the status quo, which was providing for affluence and stability for the slaveholding class and for all free people who enjoyed the bounty of the slave society. When we view slavery, we view the horrific, the, the, the terribleness of it. And of course, rightfully so. But there was an economic arm to it. There was lots of money to be made. And there's a book that was written, Professor Cornell, uh, I have his name, I, I'll, uh, Edward Baptist, history professor at Cornell University. And he's the author of The Half Has Never Been Told. The Half Has Never Been Told. He argues the economics of slavery. And if America itself would have become the economic powerhouse that it became in such a short time without the institution of slavery? The answer is no, according to the data and according to the research in the economic history. So we have to understand that our society in itself operates under that premise, that of capitalism, trying to get back to the perfect pyramid of it. Now, in contrast, abolitionists simply argue the opposite. And they discuss that the inhumane treatment of other human beings simply could not exist. This didn't just start in America. It started first in Britain and, of course, the colonies of other parts of the world where 
uh, Great Britain had colonized other countries. And it then trickled to the United States. And of course, one of the great abolitionists we know is Frederick Douglass and others that actually spoke against and, and traveled and, and pushed the idea that man should be free, no man should be chained involuntarily. And Frederick Douglass, one of my favorite, favorite persons in history and really in, in life because of not just what he did, but what he did behind the scenes. Very influential in his life. But now we come to the decision. The Civil War has started. A nation is divided. Defenders of slavery also turned to the courts, who had ruled with, had ruled with the Dred Scott decision that all blacks, not just slaves, had no legal standing as persons in our court and were property. And the Constitution protected slaveholders' rights for that property, because again, they were considered property, of course, on the, on the US Constitution. So property rights are very, very key in our country. So the law protects it. And we, of course, in statutes, it's called chattel. Okay? It's an old English, English term. But it simply means property. And with that, Justice Taney, Supreme Court Justice Taney, in this case, the Supreme Court decision is one of my favorite to analyze, one of my favorite to teach. Because, of course, it's the worst decision ever by the US Supreme Court. And many constitutional law scholars, including myself, agree to that. Justice Tiny, this was really a procedural case. It failed on procedure, all right? When you take a look at where he was from Missouri, Illinois, and then fouling into various courts, it simply falls on procedure. It could have been simply dismissed on that. No decision had to be rendered, nothing. But what ended up happening, Justice Tiny took it up on himself to write the decision, the Dred Scott decision. And the key phrase in that decision, and go back and read it if you, tonight or whenever you have time. But he makes the statement that there are no rights that any black man has that any white man is bound to respect. This was about 10 years before the first shot that started the Civil War in Fort Sumner, South Carolina. But I argue that this was the legal shot that started the Civil War. Because with that decision, with that, with that key phrase, defenders of slavery took that upon themselves and they put it on as an armor in order to defend the institution because they knew that the law was on their side, the power of the law. So the Supreme Court decision we know is notorious for its racism and frank endorsement of African-American slavery and white supremacy. Although repudiated by the Civil War and overruled by the Reconstruction Amendments, it still remains a landmark decision in American history. I had the pleasure of meeting an ancestor of Justice Tunney, who's a retired uh, advertisement executive. And it was a discussion between the ancestors of Justice Tunney and also those of Plessy and Ferguson. It was a very interesting conversation to hear how those families view their family and their influence upon our country. According to the American Battlefield Trust, the American Civil War was the defining event in our nation's history. Between 1861, 1865, 10,000 battles and engagements were fought across the continent from Vermont to New Mexico Territory and beyond. We know that the war started when the Confederates bombarded Union soldiers at Fort Sumter, South Carolina on April 12th, 1861. The war ended in the spring of 1865 when Robert E. Lee himself surrendered the last major Confederate army to Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse on April 9th, 1865. Ironically, the last battle was fought at Palmetto Ranch, Texas, on May 13th, 1865. And of course, we know that Juneteenth is celebrated because that's when the last uh, enslaved blacks heard that they were free. Again, that was because 
They did not want to let their free labor go. So the contraband decision. Let's back up before the end of the Civil War. According to the National Park Service, Fort Monroe and the Contrabands of War, when a Virginia slave owner demanded the return of three slaves that had escaped to Fort Monroe, General Butler, Major General Butler, Benjamin Butler, refused on the grounds that these persons, or property as the Confederacy considered them, were being used to wage war against the Union. So then the term contraband of war was soon used to describe escaped slaves. It's believed that Major General Vision Butler never used that phrase himself, but it's become known as that. Now, no mention was ever known of emancipation whatsoever. As a matter of fact, it's very interesting because Abraham Lincoln during that time period, history teaches us that he didn't, because of the union itself, he wanted to keep the union together. And of course, re-election was 1860. He didn't want to disturb the southern states and their institution of slavery. So he would not talk about disturbing slavery and, and the like. But, and he was actually livid at the Benjamin Butler decision and also General Fremont decision as well prior to that. General, General John C. Fremont was the commander of the Union Army of the West, and he issued a proclamation on August 30th, 1861, that effectively freed all slaves in the state of Missouri. When President Lincoln heard that, he relieved him of his duties because it was going against his reelection game plan. And of course, again, wanting to keep the Union together. Politics makes very strange bedfellows. You'll, you'll find that out throughout history. But at the, very, at the end of the day, it tends to all work out for the greater good. So to General Butler's credit, when Abraham Lincoln told him to return them, he refused. Now, eventually, Congress registered disapproval of Butler's policy when it passed the first confiscation now this law actually stated that if slaves are, in fact, property, and if this property is owned by any person, in active rebellion against lawful federal authority, then the US military has every right to deny its use to such person. So therefore, any slave that could be wrested from the Confederacy would therefore, in a technical sense, become the property of the United States government. So within days of Butler's announcement, the floodgates opened, and by the time General Fremont was sacked and then General Hunter reprimanded, there were hundreds of runaway slaves sheltering under the guns of Fort Monroe. According to Saving Places, by war's end, approximately a half a million formerly enslaved people and other Afri African American freemen had sought protection behind Union lines. These contraband, as they became known, usually lived in camps hastily erected almost anywhere the Army was stationed. The large number of runaways who flocked to the Union lines uh, belies an outdated and racist notion that enslaved African Americans simply waited for emancipation by singing hymns and strumming banjos. Rather, they seized the day, carpe diem, they seized the day to almost every chance to pursue their freedom, often risking death, and in doing so, help make slavery a central issue in the Civil War. Now, these camps, however, which enabled the runaway slaves to experience a novel degree of freedom, they were also places that became deadly to live. Let's talk about the camps for a second. In Hampton, there were two camps that were built outside the fort. Mary Peak, a free African-American woman who had taught enslaved people to read and write before the war began, opening, openly teaching classes um, under an oak tree of what's now known on the campus of Hampton University as Emancipation Oak. Also, under the oak tree 
at the fort. Classes were also held before going across, right now the interstate, but going approximately about five miles up the road. But after her death, classes were held in scorched shell of towns, courthouses, burned by the Confederate troops. The camps thrived as a vibrant political and social havens where freemen reunited with family members, they interacted with northerners and each other with unimaginable openness. Again, then we talked about the conditions in which they lived prior. Quote, they have obtained in the camps and wherever they have been, wrote a Union Provost Marshal in Louisiana, quote, a spirit of independence, a feeling that they are no longer slaves. Now keep in mind, they were in encampments. And anyone who served in the military, I've served, you know, when we build those camps out in the field, it's home, but <laughs> it's, uh, it doesn't have all the fixings of home. But to them, it was independence. To them, it was a new beginning. To them, it was something they had never experienced before. It was freedom. Now, of course, again, as I stated, President Lincoln did not want this initially. And of course, Congress had to deal with it. So they couldn't ignore the contraband issue anymore. And of course, Lincoln signed two confiscation acts. We mentioned one earlier, 1861. He signed another in 1862. And this was the first legitimization of General Butler's position, then decreeing that all enslaved people who found refuge behind Union lines would forever be free. Here you see on the screen to your, I believe it's your right, a picture of, well you see pictures of contraband soldiers and you also see a picture of William B. Gould who's a former contraband of war and his son. Now William B. Gould is sitting and his sons are standing behind him. And he's, a, he's an older man there. And his story is very significant because William B. Gould was a skilled laborer. Most slaves were. When we talk about rice, we talk about sugar cane, we talk about cotton, because the economy was so important on slave labor, individual plantation owners and those from those regions actually imported slaves from various regions of West Africa that had skills in those areas in order to cultivate those crops. But William E. Gould himself was a plasterer. He could read, he could write, and he also was a seafarer. Of course, we know that during that time period, the fastest way to get goods and services from one place to the other was through the waterways. So when he left, along with several other families, the Gould Plantation in North Carolina, up to this place called Freedom Fortress. They went through swamps. Only God knows what they experienced. But he chronicled and wrote about his experience. He also chronicled and wrote about his experience when he came to the fort. I get goosebumps every time I talk about this because I'm about to get to a really cool point. He also chronicled when Robert E. Lee was brought and placed in the casemate. He chronicled his time when he left the fort and went to Boston to help open the first AME church there. He also chronicled his time as being the first, one of the first Navy, black Navy sailors in the US military because they realized that he was a skilled man. So he and all his sons eventually ended up serving in the US Armed Forces in one capacity or the other. He chronicled all that. But it didn't come to our knowing or didn't come to being until one day, William B. Gould IV, his great-great-great-grandson, 
was helping his uncle move out of his house into an assisted living place. And he was moving things down from the attic, and there were some things in a box on the side of the street. And he noticed this old leather, you know, something about old good leather. You know, it just has a distinct look to it, distinct feel. He said, Uncle, what is that? He said, I don't know. You know, you can take a look at it, I'm throwing every, all it out. So he starts to go through it. He sees this phenomenal handwriting. He sees this phenomenal drawings of ships, frigates. And he sees the dates that are here. He says, wait a minute, this can't be 1863. It's, there's no way it could be 1860, 1864. But he sees these dates, and he starts to read. And he starts to go through it, go through it. And he can't believe what he's reading, so he gets his good friend, John Hope Franklin, to help him with it. And he goes through and he says, listen, this is, they came to the conclusion that this was one of the most well-kept diaries of the time in slavery, written by an enslaved person. So they put it all together, along with a group of historians, and it's a book called Diary of a Contraband, the story of a black Navy sailor. I remember he was brought to a lecture. Um, it's, he's a Stanford law professor, emeritus now. And he was brought to our university uh, law school when I was in law school years ago. And the book had just printed. And he gave a lecture about it, of course. You know, I'm thinking about constitutional law, not really thinking about that, but it was interesting to me. And my good friend, my chancellor, who's my mentor, we talked about, I talked about Fort Monroe here. He said, hey, remember that professor from Stanford who had a great, great grandfather? He said, go back and take a look at that book. It may be of use to you. So it was, and we were able to uh, invite him down and give a lecture uh, at the university. And it was one of, the, one of the great moments of my life uh, to be able to do that. But here's the cool point. So they got all these historians, right? They got all these individuals that have written more books than I've read, probably. And they're going through, and they document everything. And, I get a chance to take him on a tour of Fort Monroe. Of course, it was called Old Point Comfort at the time. So I get him there, and he's talking. He's getting a private tour uh, with one of the uh, rangers from the National Park Service. And we're walking, and he says, you know, there's this, there's this one aspect of my great-great-grandfather's book that I, I, we just couldn't figure out. There was a point on the map, and he said it was Old Point, it was Point Comfort. And we couldn't find any map with it on that. Can you tell me where that is? <laughs> and he stands back, the range he looks, his chest is out a little bit. And we're, we're kind of at the top of where, where the gun battery is, overlooking the water. And he says, sir, you're standing on it right now. And at that moment, I was instrumental in helping him complete his journey in his great-great-grandfather's journey, understanding it. So that was a very cool moment for me. With that being the case, I want you to hear something. You know, we're fortunate enough to live in history. We're fortunate enough to experience it every day. But one thing that Professor Gould mentioned, and for all you baseball fanatics, he was also the attorney that settled the last, not the last baseball strike, we just had one, but the 1992 baseball strike, Major League Baseball strike, when he was uh, the head of the National Labor Relations Board. All right, so as far as you baseball fanatics out there. As a matter of fact, it was said that uh, the former commissioner, he said, next to Jackie Robinson, William Gould is probably the most influential African-American in golf, I mean in baseball. I said golf because I love golf, but anyway. <laughs> baseball itself. All right, so with that being the case, he said, what I would love to do, he said, whoever takes this up next, he said, are individuals to find the other people that travel with my great-great-grandfather. 
What were their stories? Where did they come from? What did they experience? And I thought about that. And when I have guests that come to the area, I always take them to the fort, no matter who they are. Because to me, and I'll tell you why in here in just a moment, to me is the turning point, that journey, walking through those gates, is the turning point of our country, it's the turning point of individuals' lives, it's the turning point of all the hopes and dreams of our posterity. Lavelle, I heard a lot about you. Joe, same here. Uh, it's so good to be out here at Fort Monroe uh, on this beautiful day. And we know the, the history of this place, the significance of it as it relates to African Americans and really America, because this is the place of the country band mm -hmm. decision. It's the place where many of our forefathers risked their lives, risked everything because they heard of a place that they could come to and receive that elusive freedom which our country stood for. Yes, what they were seeking all their lives from birth up until the point they came here. And they took that chance knowing that a war was on at the time, not knowing what their fate would be when they got here. You know, to... Go, we can't go back in time. We can't go into the conversations that individuals were having on various plantations. We can't walk in their steps and understand the dangers that they encountered crossing many, many dangerous waterways, many dangerous roads, many dangerous lands. But you can only imagine that hope that they had, that small sliver of hope that if they only made it to this place, then they would have freedom. Men, women, and children had that desire to come here. They made it here to this fort, Fort Monroe, and they were willing to receive whatever lied in, sto uh, in store for them right here at Fort Monroe. And what lied in store for them, they believe, was better than what they had? It had to be. It, it had to be better. Um, you know, false promises all along, false, uh, the hope that they had of, of sometime uh, being free, not being enslaved, uh, working for themselves. And, and that labor that they were pouring in all that they were doing, benefiting them, that's what they wanted. They wanted to be self-sufficient, and this was their opportunity to do so. You know, Joe, many times we think about the 1960s as being the first movement of civil rights in America, especially for African Americans. But really, if you think about it, 1861, 1865 to 1870, the contraband decision was really the first piece of legislation that I believe kicked off the first civil rights movement for our people. Yeah, and it was because of that decision that led to other decisions that would further enhance the freedom that those who came here to Fort Monroe to obtain, they got it here. And that was the foundation for other legislation to come forth, to be a part of them continually uh, giving them the rights that they so um, rightly deserve. Absolutely. You know, as we you know, look out you know, of the fort, and you see the waterways, mm -hmm. you see the fortifications. And the history of this fortification being the largest mason fortified fort in the United States, it brings a sense of pride, a sense of belonging to know that we belong. Yes. Not only do we belong, but, but check, look at the construction. Yeah. I, I, we, you know, we people talk about Robert E. Lee and all that he did to 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 be the engineer to construct all right. this, but that physical labor. That's our ancestors That's right. who, who, who did this, who put all this together. So that should be acknowledged also. Absolutely. And Joe, you wear the uniform, the uniform that the colored troops, the regiment wore to fight for this freedom. Once they got here, they said, we're just not here sitting on what we found, but we're gonna pick up arms and fight for that freedom as well. What does that uniform mean to you? 
it means that those men did not sit idly by waiting for that freedom. As you stated so, so eloquently, they were proactive in, in seeking their freedom and in their attempt uh, or their success yes. in coming here and making so, it here uh, was that. It, that was built upon because of their action, 200,000 uh, black men joined the Union Army and the Union Navy, and they were uh, a part of that element that won that war. I like to say, as I've studied and our history, the laws and public policies that have helped to shape our country, our nation, and these United States of America, I, I've come to the conclusion that there's nothing more American than being African-American. The people who bled, the people who shed tears, shed their blood, gave their children, gave their labor, their ingenuity, their innovation, as you just pointed out here, for the upbringing of this country and gave their lives in honor of it. Even when a country did not want to give back to them, they still gave. And I think that's one of the greatest legacies as African Americans that we have on this country. Yes. And we look at, when you look at the military action of this nation, all those military actions, our ancestors were somewhat involved. Um, being in arms, picking up arms and, and, and fighting for the cause, um, or prior to that, giving up their labor for this nation to be the nation that it is and not benefiting from it. Uh, we were always there. Uh, we were always willing to do our part to make this nation a great nation that it is. And as you stated, they didn't give back. So we're still in a place where we're still earning that uh, respect, where we're still earning that opportunity to be uh, full citizens. Mm -hmm. You know, I think about the families that crossed over. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about the families that came from afar off, to this place, because they heard of a decision. They heard of a place that they could receive freedom. If you look right over here, this would be the bridge that they crossed. That would be the gate that they walked through. Wow. And when I bring visitors and, and friends and family here to visit this, this fort, I tell them, I stop at that gate, I stop right there. And I tell them, I said, this, on this side of the gate, they were slaves, they were property of someone else. They did not have freedom. They did not have their own identity. And then I continued walking or driving on. And I said, as they walk through that tunnel, when they reach on the other side, no more are they slaves. No more are they bound. No more do they have no identity. No more do they belong to someone else. But when they get to the other side, to the other side. I like that, that's well stated. Through that gate is, is where that happened, um, right there. And, and can, can you imagine going through that gate and, and see all the, the men dressed in blue? Uh, and and I'm, I know that some of those men had the desire right then and there for their opportunity to be dressed in blue. That's right. It wasn't given to them immediately, but it, it finally, it eventually came on. That's right. When we, when we talk about those families, I was fortunate enough to complete the journey of a law professor, Professor Emeritus at Stanford, uh, William Gould. And he actually had his great-great-grandfather from the Gould Plantation in North Carolina, who was a mason. And he was a plasterer for the most part. And he was a skilled laborer. And he made the journey along with several other families from that area. And when they got here, they knew that he had skill because he was a seeker, because of course, most of the travel of goods and, and, and services were by waterway. We didn't have interstates at the time, we didn't have highways, we didn't have the car, we had horse and buggy, but the waterways was the main way to transport those goods and services. So he was skilled as a seafarer. He was skilled as a plasterer, and he could also write and also read. So when he got here, when they formed that first military troop, he was one of the first Navy sailors in the U.S., African-American Navy sailors in the U.S. Army, and all of his sons actually served in the military. And I remember we were walking and we went to the top of the fort, and 
Professor Gore, he said, out of all of my, and John Ho Franklin actually helped him to go through the records of his great, great grandfather who kept a diary. And in his diary, he actually wrote the day that Jefferson Davis was brought here and imprisoned in the casement. So we see that the history has really just started to become uncovered. So we see that, again, the miseducation of America forced us to believe a narrative about a group of people that actually was not true. And it's also forced, in many instances, the group of people to, to believe that narrative about themselves. So I believe that a theory that I teach from is the theory of laws and public policy. I believe that laws and public policy themselves are created in its effect or intent to do three things. To control and dictate people, beliefs, and resources. Every single law, every single statute, every single court case decision, you can pull that and it sits on all fours on what it dictates as relates to either what a person believes, either where resources go, or what happens in that situation. People, beliefs, and resources. With that being the case, we see why it's so important to understand the true story and the true facts about the contraband decision because it shows a drive of people to create something out of nothing. There was no hope at that time. There was no ideas of, no examples of true freedom at that time. But if they could just make it to this place, they believed that they could be free. Self-emancipation, doing for yourself. Also, they just didn't stop there. I told the story how others went to different parts of the country, even right here in Virginia. We see where individuals that came from were a part of that contraband decision, also did great things, became lawyers, became statesmen, became educators, became doctors, and of course, builders. So we see where this decision before any other decision, before the 1866 Civil Rights Act, the various Civil Rights Acts of 1868, 1870, which is actually a copy and paste. So the 1960 Civil Rights Act, the 1960 Voting Rights and the 65 Voting Rights Act, and others, Fair Housing Act, is simply a copy and paste of the 1860s Civil Rights legislation. The reason of that is because even though, go back and take a look at it, even though the legislation was written, it had no teeth, there was no enforcement. It was good on paper, but there was no penalty if you didn't obey it. So the states were like, we're just not gonna do it. So just a quick note here. After the Fortress assassination of President Kennedy, Leonard Baines Johnson, wanted to carry that legacy. He needed a win. So they simply took a look at that legislation, added teeth to it, enforcement. So of course, there's a legal case in which that particular Civil Rights Act of 1964 actually holds up in court and provides the protection of individuals. And I believe that that particular act, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, I've actually done a presentation, a lecture on that, where it is the most powerful, I believe, act that 
that we've created in our country because it extends across all individuals, no matter what status, no matter what race or creed, and provides protection for those individuals, where previously it had not. So all of the rights, all other rights, all of the benefits of our country, now you're able to take advantage of them because of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. But I digress. Maybe I'll come back and lecture on that one. But where are we now? Where are we now? We talk about the contraband decision, the Civil War itself, 1861 to 1865. But and the importance and the significance of the contraband decision. But where are we today in 2022? Do we see states trying to secede from the Union? The states that tried to secede during that time period, South Carolina, 1860, Mississippi, 1861, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Texas, Virginia, Arkansas, North Carolina, and Tennessee, all 1861 from January to June. Believe it or not, that was a very, according to uh, legal history, that was a very uh, complex issue because some believe that maybe they could. But of course, in Texas versus White, 1868, it was determined that secession was unconstitutional. Chief Justice uh, Salmon Chase actually wrote the majority opinion in that, where he stated that the ordinance of secession and all acts of legislation intended to give effect to that ordinance were absolutely no, and they were utterly without operation in law. But that wasn't the case before that decision. So I believe that the contraband decision itself was instrumental in helping to create four things. Helping to create, number one, independence and family. Independence of family. Family is the key, it's the center of any society. And the contraband decision provided that opportunity, finally. Also, economic. The economic upper mobility for those that can finally work for themselves and have for themselves. Third, the right to own and belong. The right to own and belong. For the first time, individuals were able and had the right, the opportunity, to belong and also to own. And many did. They went to communities and built their communities, built their churches, built their schools, built their homes. To this day, some of them still exist. And then finally, to have a voice. And we know that the voice that we, the greatest voice we have in our society is the voice of voting. So do we see in society today where those four areas are being taken away? or limited. I'll give you this last piece because we got about, Alan's giving, giving me the stand. <laughs> so. <laughs> there you go. I told him, I said, yeah, maybe 44 minutes. I can't talk that long. Yeah, right. So. <laughs> but let's take a look at the voter, one voter ID law, voter, what I call voter restriction laws uh, that was enacted. Right in North Carolina, one of the states that seceded from the Union, uh, one of these, matter of fact, they seceded right after, right after Virginia. North Carolina voter ID law was struck down as discriminatory by the federal court. The first, Fourth Circuit, which of course we're a part of in this particular, uh, in the federal circuit courts, they struck it down because the federal court itself stated, this is in the opinion, they said that the voting laws were enacted with, quote, discriminatory intent, targeting African Americans, quote, with almost surgical precision to disenfranchise. It was meant to disenfranchise their vote. Now we saw that after part of the Voting Rights Act, the, the formula which also made null and void the preclearance of the Voter Rights Act was struck down under Shelby County versus Holder. We saw states start to enact these very restrictive laws and for the most part turn back the clock on 
access to the voter box as opposed to, well, access to the voting box and restricting access to the voting box. So we see that also in that particular state, they had voting precincts where you had about 13. They took them down to one. So we see that even today, in 2022, from 1862, there were efforts to turn back and eliminate the gains that were created by the contraband decision itself for family and independence, for economic upper mobility, for the right to own and belong, and the ability to have a voice in society. Will we see 1862, prior to 1862 again? Forward. That's in our hands. So that question belongs to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. That uh, illuminating. We do have time for, for some questions. You have a question. Thank you, Dr. Cleo, for that wonderful presentation. I recall that uh, when uh, Professor Gould uh, came to lecture, we yes. had a, a night, this is like 15 years ago now. It, right? was, it was. It was. <laughs> um, we had a great discussion, and one of the things he said was that you can understand all of the politics today simply by going back to 1862. Yeah, so, so this is, uh, as you point out, this is nothing new. This is just a continuation of that uh, struggle of that time. And it, it's very important that our educational system acknowledges this rather than trying to ban it in having lines to call to e email into the state for teachers that explain this history. Yeah. Very good point. You know, I've, I was at a basketball game for my son, and one of the history teachers were there, and she made a, made a joke in jest, but it was very serious. She said, oh, I'm just waiting to get turned in to the, uh, you know, about teaching history, you know, the tip line that, that exists. Um, to your point, history itself, when I mention the prism that I teach from, history is at the very top, at the top. In this lecture, I started from there. Because without understanding what happened, we can't understand what is. And we can't predict what's going to be. I thought I saw uh, another hand. Sorry. Dr. Clavel, thank you so much. Very enlightening discussion. Yes. And I enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, so if you can enlighten us of the elusive freedom can you tell us when that would have been for Africans in America? Well, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a moving ball. You know, and the reason why I say it's a moving ball because I wanted to give the example of that case, the North Carolina case, all right? Because what happens is, is that once you make a gain, once gains are made, then automatically there's an attack on those gains, right? So there's this belief, again, think about this. When, when, I, when I talked about my theory of laws and public policy, I, I want you to hear me on this. I want you to take off the blinders and just hear what I'm about to say. Laws and public policy are created in its intent or effect to control and dictate people, beliefs, and resources. People, beliefs, and resources. Beliefs is very important. Why do I say that? Before the decision of Brown versus Board of Education 2. Brown versus Board of Education 1 actually failed, but 2. The day before, the, it was legal, thereby, it was constitutional, thereby legal to have segregation in schools. The day after that decision was passed, it became unconstitutional, thereby illegal. That's the law. But there was a structure of belief that was ingrained in our society. That some should have the best, 
no matter what, and others should not, no matter what. Resources should go to this school, no matter what. Resources should not go to this school, no matter what. You can live in this part of town and go to the other part of town if you want. But those in this part of town got to stay over here. And you can't come over here unless you're working. And after you finish working, remember Sundown Towns? You better get out of there. So that's a belief. So when you have that belief that I should have, that I've always had, and it's not a, it's, it's, it's not a belief that's so off, right? Because at the end of the day, think about it. This is European America that we're a part of, right? It was started with that, 1607. That's how it started. So if you start something, you own it. You believe you can dictate it. And you create the laws to effectuate that. Now, it's not saying it's right. It's not saying it's justified. But I understand it. That's the social behavior. That's the interaction, right? And then you create laws around it to effectuate that belief, that structure. And it's very hard to chip away. Very hard to chip away at that. We see now, last point, Alan, we see now in the 2020 Black Lives Matter movement that took place, you heard a lot of, we saw a lot of stuff that happened on the streets, right, in the community and so forth. But you start to hear a lot in corporate America of African Americans, black women, black men, and so forth, that start to talk about what they were carrying because of that authority that they were given was not being respected. And that extra, what do we call the black tax that was placed upon them and had to go through that, right? Doctors, um, there's an article just came out today, I sent it to uh, my, my sister-in-law and, and brother and, uh, and my wife, they all went to med school. And, you know, to let, you know, because that's something that they carry. So imagine having somebody's life in your hand and you got a you know, nurse or CNA disrespecting you or saying, I'm not going to do something because you're black. It happens all the time, all the time. But you got to stay focused on that page. Right? So it's, uh, when will it happen? In the words of Justice Tony's relative, he said, look, for my generation, he was a retired advertiser. He said, I don't have any hope about that. He said, but for my grandkids, he said, I do have hope that things will get better. So as we continue to live and interact, we see the gelling of ideas and ideology more so than race and skin color. So, the, but that, so that's another issue we're going to deal with, not colorism, but ideology and moving forward. So I think that was a question. All right. Anyone else? With, yeah, one more. We have time for one more. Two more. <laughs> Hi. Colonel Rich McKinney, on your presentation there, I was very impressed with your description of going across the moat into the main gate. I had come to that exact same opinion. Um, the feeling of going from slave to freedman. But the point at which I thought it should be is a couple hundred yards from the one you picked. If you look at a map of 1863, the road onto Fort Monroe went across the sandbar. And that is the point where the Mercury Boulevard Bridge is now. Yeah. Yeah. They came across to Freedom's Fortress. I had contended that bridge should be Freedom's Fortress Bridge. I wrote letters. I spoke before the city council. And I could not get historians to back me on that. What would, what would you believe on that? You, you know, that's a, that's a very good point. I never thought about it. I think that the bridge, that, now that bridge would lead to, and I would have to uh, take a closer look at it uh, from a historical map and see exactly where it is and also have uh, someone trained in it in that area to actually guide me through it. But that bridge would have led to the fort. 
But of course, with the fort being fortified, you're still on the outside of it. But the fort being fortified, you wouldn't have found safety and freedom until you got through that particular fortified piece of the uh, part of the gate to go inside. However, to your point, you had to cross that bridge in order to get over to it because once you did, you actually own the fort's property. So, I would love to uh, take a look at that. So let's let's talk afterwards. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Thank you. Good evening, Doctor. Evening. Uh, appreciate your presentation and uh, your historical analysis. There were, I got a couple of points. I'll try to keep it succinct, though. Um, I appreciate your point about history and its impact um, and on our consciousness. And I invite people to read um, Arthur Schlesinger Jr.'s book, Disuniting yep. of America, where he talks about history being a weapon. Um, so you can go back and take a look at that. But earlier in your presentation, you mentioned five areas that you teach from, yes. and I only got two of them, history and economics. If you could repeat those, that'd sure. be great. Sure, history, economics, politics, public policy and law are together, and social behavior interaction. Okay, thank you. I um, also appreciate you bringing Dred Scott into the conversation. Was there an impact that David Walker had that preceded um, Dred Scott in, in, in getting to Dred Scott and then getting to contraband? And then finally, uh, again, I appreciate you bringing up even North Carolina with acting as surgical precision. Absolutely. And if you could bring an analysis on rights versus immunity. All right. So very quickly, I'll take 60 seconds on this, Al. <laughs> take your time. Yeah, so David Walker, very influential, uh, also played a part in that as well, in getting to those particular steps and where we are until he got to the Civil War and where we are today. I agree. Um, as it relates to, um, you mentioned surgical precision. I know rights and, and immunity. I'm going to address that last, but what was the second? Okay, gotcha. Got it. Okay, so lastly, rights versus immunity. So that's, uh, that, that's something that, you know, as, uh, as law professor, we'll sit around and, and, and work for days, right? So when we take a look at what are rights, let's just kind of break it down very quick, elementary. Rights are basically your opportunity or given opportunity to operate in society, all right, whatever it is. So you have the right to vote. You have the right to uh, purchase a home. You have, in this area, you have the right to open up a bank account. You have the right to do X, Y, Z. So you're given the opportunity to operate in society, all right? Immunity, you have rights as a part of that, but there is an extra that's given to you. Now you, have the, uh, now you have the right to operate under authority without any penalty in the event that you mess up. So now you're, it's, an, it's, it's creating an imbalance with some that have not only rights, but they can tread upon your rights and still operate in society as if nothing happened. So it's kind of a pendulum swinging back to pre-1861, right? But it determines what is it? Is it under the color of law? Or is it under practice, right? Because there are some practices that we have in our society that's not law, but it's like law sometimes even greater than law, right? There's, you know, we all grew up, you know, with parents and grandparents, and there were some things you didn't do, right? There was nothing written <laughs> in the law, but you knew. That's a no-no, right? So that's where I believe the imbalance comes in being created. Uh, what is the check? But there's always a check and balance, right? With an imbalance comes a check to bring about balance. The question becomes, those actions that create, that tread upon those rights, 
do they now become the individuals that have rights? Do they now have an opportunity in order to contest the immunity, the actions against those individuals, and pull the veil back on that immunity that's given to them, right? So that's where the fight is. That's where the fight is. But that's a great question. Absolutely. No? Very good. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for good questions. Eric, thank you for a wonderful presentation, and you are always welcome back here. So <laughs> thank you. we'll work on making that happen. So remember the things that I mentioned when we first started. They're going to be happening here in the near future. Please come back and join us, and thank you for coming out tonight.